The Tote and Pairs podcast is brought to you by Tote and Pairs, the full service agency that designs and markets products, services, and experiences for women. You can find out more about us online at toteandpairs.com or on social at Tote and Pairs. You're listening to the Tote and Pairs podcast, where every other week we're bringing together industry experts, scholars, and creatives to explore how the many lenses a woman wears shapes her perspective. Tune in every other week for an intersectional perspective. When I was 25, I drove a black 1993 Lincoln Town Car. And during this time, I lived in a suburb on the outskirts of Atlanta. At this time, I also worked a job that required me to typically be on the road before the sun was up and most days drive home after the sun had gone down. On a particular strip of road, in a one-year time period, I was stopped six times in this town car. Never once did I receive a ticket nor a warning. Twice I was pulled over by the same police officer. I was told that my car was suspicious and always asked if I had weapons or drugs in the car. Coincidence? I think not. The reasoning that I was always told for me being pulled over was that my tag light was out. Not my tail light, but my tag light. But the real reason I was pulled over is because I was driving a car that they perceived to be a drug dealer's car, and I was a young black man. Hi, welcome to another episode of the Toten Pairs podcast. I'm Amber Anderson, host and the founder and head of strategy at Toten Pairs. And with me today, I have our co-founder, Kaisan Anderson. Welcome, Kaisan. Hello, hello. How are you doing? You guys never hear from Kaisan because he's always <laughs> behind the scenes. He does exist, I promise. <laughs> I'm here in the flesh. I'm alive. <laughs> We're grateful for Kai to be here. Kai does all of our media. He is the head of media here. So our podcast is produced by Kai as well as any of our videos. Um, anything related to music um, and technology behind the scenes is managed by Kai San, uh, who I call Kai. Kai is uh, my business partner. He's also my husband. So we're the fortunate duo behind Toten Pairs um, that makes the world go round. Well, I brought Kai on board today because we're going to be having a conversation. This podcast episode is around confronting biases. And when we're recording it, it is June 15th, 2020. The United States has seen a series of protests and riots surrounding the killing of George Floyd, uh, who was an African-American man who, were, who was murdered by the police in Minneapolis. Um, and so what I wanted to do was, first and foremost, we've stepped away for a bit as we've been um, dealing with coronavirus and trying to really, you know, stay in there and help our clients navigate through the new normal. Um, and then all of this kind of broke. And so we had planned on doing a little bit of a break on the podcast, but I thought it was really important for us to step in, um, start to offer some guidance and some insights into what we're finding behind the scenes for any um, of their listeners, as well as give you all a chance to hear from us personally. As African Americans, you know, this obviously deeply resonates with us. Um, The killing of George Floyd and all of the others who have been, you know, murdered um, or hurt um, due to police brutality is something that uh, is close to home. I thought it was really important for us as we um, advocate for our clients to be very authentic um, and personal in the way that they connect with their customers, that we also do the same thing for you all. So I brought Kaisan on for us to have a conversation as an African-American family um, here in the United States. What does it feel like? What are our thoughts? Uh, what are the data say? Um, and then what can businesses and brands do as of, always will offer some tips and tricks on how you can navigate this new normal and COVID, but uh, as well as uh, dealing with systematic racism and the elements that come along with um, being able to fight for justice in your business. So Kai, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, So we're going to begin first by uh, a quote that I have heard by Martin Luther King Jr. that really resonates with me. It says, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. And for Kai and I, we've been very vocal about, you know, our struggles, I think, personally, as an African-American family and business owners. But we don't usually bring that into the professional setting. Our agency has been set up in a way where, you know, we're, you know, speaking directly, but we don't talk about how things personally affect us. Um, And I think that this is a great opportunity for us to to have that conversation. Uh, It's often that we look at people and we say, you know, this is something that's happening in theory or this is something that's happening to other people. But it's not true. 
Um, the, the issues that have specifically been impacting the African-American community have had a direct impact on us as well. Um, and I think that what we can do is shed some light on this topic personally, um, as well as professionally, uh, as we navigate through, through the nuances of it. So with that being said, Kai, I'm, I'm going to start because you and I had this conversation uh, several times uh, over the last couple of weeks about what does it mean when we talk about police brutality? What does it mean to talk about systematic racism and the impacts that that personally has on the African-American community? And one of the things that I will talk about is uh, I pulled up some statistics that say most black people have said, 83%, um, that racism is is an issue for them, that they've either directly experienced discrimination or been treated unfairly because of their race. 83%. You can compare that to Asians who have said 73%, Hispanics, 65%. uh, And then we compare it to our white counterparts who only say that race has been an issue for them at 31%. This is pulled from the Pew Research Center. And when we sat down, Kai, and started talking about your experiences with race, it was because I was working on um, a a session that I gave to 900 women. There were 900 women on the webinar that I gave the other day talking about confronting biases. And what I did is I, I stopped and thought, you know, let me think about my experiences personally with the police because I grew up in a middle, upper middle class neighborhood in Illinois, in the suburbs. And when I remember the police, it was always around these two campaigns. It was officer friendly, and it was D.A.R.E., which was Drug Abuse Resistance Education. I can still remember that. We even had T-shirts. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, the black shirts with the red letters. Yeah, exactly. I do remember that. Yep. So, I mean, they were brilliant campaigns because, you know, behind the scenes as citizens, we didn't realize that what was happening was there was a real big distrust amongst citizens and the police. So there was a campaign that was run to show that the police were doing good work and that they could be trusted and the officer friendly campaign is something that happened when I was in elementary school and then the dare campaign is something that we caught on to in like middle school and high school and those are the two campaigns that really stick with me to this day so when I thought about you know police growing up I didn't fear them you know but I am a five foot under five foot African-American woman living in the middle class neighborhood I didn't fear the police they weren't uh, you know, patrolling our neighborhood. They only came around for floats and stuff like that. Like when we were in parades, we saw the police. That was mm-hmm. about the only time. But as I started talking to you about the police, your experiences were drastically different. Um, and so it made me stop and think, even within our own household, how we could have two totally different perspectives of the police. Um, and of course, being your wife, I started to recognize once we got together Um, and we're dating for a while, how you did have a different perspective because your experiences were drastically different Mm -hmm. when it came to the relationships that you had with the police. Now, calling you out, you're only, what, 5'7", (laughs) 5'8"? Yeah, I'm about 5'7", probably 170 pounds. And what I did is I had taken note of all of your interactions with the police, and I'm going to read them off because I think it's really was eye-opening for me. And I wouldn't even ask you to remember it because there were so many of them. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I asked Kai to take a moment and let's talk about your interactions. We started at 14 years old where you said you were pulled over because you look suspicious, stopped and patted down. You were in front of Chili's right near Arizona State University's campus on a main road. Mm -hmm. At 16 years old, you looked too young to be driving, so you were pulled over then. At 17 years old, you fit the description. At 18, you were stopped twice. Once you were ticketed for walking in the bike lane. The second time, you were pepper sprayed for loitering. Mm -hmm. Again, this is an ASU, Arizona State University's main road. Uh, At 19, you were pulled over for not coming to a complete stop. From 20 to 27, you were pulled over every year, at least once a year, for fitting the description. At 28, though, things started to get a lot worse, and this is when I can remember uh, it becoming a challenge for us. At this point, we've been together six years. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, where you were two times in front of your home outside talking on the phone. The police were called because somebody said they were reporting a robbery. Mm -hmm. There were five cop cars that arrived, 10 officers, assault rifles were drawn, and they were telling you to get down and asking you what was happening. That happened two times in the same house in the same year. Mm -hmm. Then the other one uh, that also sticks out to me is at 31 when you were pulled over on the freeway. At this point, we've already experienced so many situations where you're getting pulled over that we came up with the plan. Do you remember? Yeah, the plan was 
as soon as I felt like I was being pulled over, I had to make sure I called you, yeah. <laughs> leave the phone on so you could hear what was going on. Yeah, we had a whole we had a whole system set up. Yeah, so the plan was call, leave the phone on. What I would do is I would call 911, mm-hmm. ask what was going on, let them know that you were not a risk and that you would be fine. Mm-hmm. This one particular time, however, I did call 911 and they had reported that you were fleeing. Mm-hmm. And so I got in the car and was trying to tell the 911 agent he's not fleeing, he's not a threat, and I'm talking her through this scenario. And she ends with me because there's not much more she wants to talk about. And, you know, I'm rushing to try and find you, right? Mm -hmm. Do you remember? Yeah, the issue was that they were saying that I didn't pull over fast enough once they put the the cop lights on. So instead of pulling over right away, I went up the off ramp and pulled over there. So they drew their guns. I had to put my hands out and they handcuffed me. And after that incident, they ended up actually taking my license plate so I couldn't drive my car anymore. And they left you on the road. And they, they left me there, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the hardest part about it is that obviously, you know, we look at George Floyd and we say, this could be you. This could have been you 20 times, mm-hmm. 30 times over. Yep. And um, I think one of the things that's happening a lot is a lot of brands are looking at the situation and they're saying, you know, wow, a person, you know, um, it's unfortunate that George Floyd experienced this, George Floyd, but behind the scenes, you know, black families all over the world are seeing themselves. They're seeing their, you know, either it happens to women as well, but in this particular case, they're seeing their husbands, they're seeing their fathers, they're seeing their nephews, they're seeing their uncles, they're seeing their children. And so as we go through these nuances of race, and we look at brands that are trying to respond to this. Um, I've been hit up a lot of times with questions around what's the right response. And many of the times what I say is, um, I don't think this is a complicated issue. I think when you look and you see a human being and what's happened to these this human being, what's happening to a group of human beings, we respond the way we would if it was any human being. Mm-hmm. It's not a black issue. It's a human's issue. And right. so when you look at it as a human being and you can empathize, then the words become easier. Right? Yeah, that's that's exactly how I feel. These these issues that are going on, it's, it's for sure a human issue. So for me, at least, when I see somebody going through trouble, um, see a killing or a murder or whatever it may be, I try to put myself in those shoes. Like, how would I feel if that was my uncle, if that was my brother, if that was my father, if that, you know, put yourself in that, in that person's shoes and then you can feel what that human emotion feels like. And then that's when all of us can come together and say, you know what, this is an issue for all of us to deal with. You know, if it happens to one, it's happening to all of us. Well, the good thing is that it sounds like people are starting to get there. For sure. Right. Um, so we found that there was a survey that said, that Americans are starting to take this a little bit more seriously. Two-thirds of U.S. adults say they support the movement of Black Lives Matter, which is very contrast to a few years ago Mm -hmm. uh, when the Black Lives Matter movement came out. It came out in response to Trayvon Martin being murdered and George Zimmerman being released from prison because of that. And at that point in time, the black community, I think, understood what Black Lives Matter meant um, and took a step back in that decision by the courts to release George Zimmerman. It was it was a blow. Uh, and in many cases, I think I can say directly that I felt um, incredibly helpless, as if our voices didn't matter. Yeah, I feel like with the Trayvon Martin thing, and sad to say this, I feel like since it wasn't filmed, mm-hmm. that it was maybe kind of harder to understand if you didn't know that those things were going on. Now, if you talk to many uh, African Americans, males, females, they were like, oh, okay, I already know what that is because I've been through that. My uncle's been through that. My brother's been through that. But I think since we're in the, the age of camera phones and everyone's filming everything, now that you can see, oh, okay, I know I heard some people talking about it, but now I can see this is really what's going on. Maybe that's one of the main reasons why people are starting to finally fall in line and say, okay, this is an issue that we all need to deal with. Yeah, and I think that one of the things that's been really insightful is to see how brands have come on board. Right. So now you're seeing Nike and all these companies supporting Juneteenth and uh, they have their social media messages. But what what's also come to light is that um, people are calling out the companies that are only jumping on the bandwagon Mm -hmm. that have not had 
a person of color on their social media, Instagram feed that has never mentioned anything about black lives mattering in the past, or even if you look at their leadership team, doesn't have a person of color on the leadership team. Uh, and so there's a, it's a really um, crossroads for a lot of organizations that have not done the work in the past to understand or um, connect with the diversity in the audience. Um, and so as a result, what we're seeing now is brands want to be able to do something different. They want to be able to speak to these injustices, have recognized that they haven't done the work in the past and are trying to find a crossroads. But this isn't the end. There's other groups within the community that are also running through challenges. And so what we need to do as companies and what we need to do as marketers is make sure that we do create an understanding within our organization of our customers first, right? Mm -hmm. They're customers, but behind that, and more importantly than that, they're people. And so people have been experiencing challenges. And what is it that we need to do to make sure that we're creating great products, but we're also creating messaging that one does not directly hurt the people that are in our community. In the case of African-Americans, we can talk directly to the media, putting out portrayals of African-American men and African-American women and African-American children being a certain way. And as a result of that, we've created these biases in people's minds that there's threats. So understanding what is our role in that and doing a better job. The other piece is understanding the importance of diversifying our teams so that we do have somebody there uh, and multiple people there to share various perspectives. And when I say that, I say that today and I've said that always, the importance of diversity in creating products and in creating uh, programs and creating organizations, creating services, whatever it is that you're creating, uh, you need to make sure that you have multiple perspectives on it because it's going to hit multiple audiences and it just makes it better for you to have that view. I think the other important piece is now that the community is demanding it, right? When we say things like two thirds of U.S. adults now support Black Lives Matter, that is very much a new phenomenon to see that. Right. But that is the trend that's happening. And we know that millennials and the younger generation has already been on board with this. Now, there is a breakdown, and I think this is where it, it can become important for you as a company to understand, um, you know, how do you navigate these waters? Because, for example, when you compare Democrats versus Republicans, 91% of Democrats uh, lean towards the support of the movement, whereas only 40% 40, 40 of Republicans do. Mm. So as much as we, we want to say, you know, hey, there's a blanket statement, you really do need to understand your audience um, and understand what your core values are as an organization to ensure that you are really bleeding out what it is that you believe, whether or not the people in your community um, reflect that, right? Whether they reflect your values or their, your goals or not uh, is something you understand by understanding your target audience. Um, and if they don't, uh, then making a decision about where do you sit and what do you do about that. If they do, making sure you're speaking directly to them and the concerns that they have, the, the issues that are important to them, and navigating through that space very eloquently. So I think that was the first thing. It, you know, it was really good to see, um, finally, Kai, that people are seeing the issues that we're seeing. The reason that we exist here at Toten Pairs is because we've always recognized that these gaps exist, and we wanted to do our part to make sure we were working with the companies that cared, that wanted to create these honest connections, that wanted to support their communities, that wanted to do better. That was first and foremost. But also because we wanted to put good work out there that actually spoke to the people. Yeah, it's, it's awesome to um, finally give a voice to the voiceless. For a long time, African Americans have been saying, I mean, there's a problem going on with this system. There's a problem. There's a problem. It's fun. It's great to finally have people say, you know what, this this is a problem. Let's do something about it. That's that's a good feeling. Yeah. So what what I'm going to do next is let's talk a little bit about this problem, because what's happened so far is we talk a lot in theory. You know, it's like, oh, there's a problem. You know, where is it coming from? And what's the solution? Is it that I just um, put out some content that says, hey, here's some ways that you can go become a better ally? And I swear I cringe whenever I hear that. Because what that does is I've seen brands do, hey, here's some news articles that will help you become a better ally to your black brothers and sisters. Or here's how we're donating money to Black Lives Matter, as if that solves the problem. Mm -hmm. When in reality, the issue is so much more embedded. It's a personal issue. Right? There's a personal issue with 
in the organization, if you do not have any people of color on your leadership team, if you don't have any people of color in your management team, if you don't have any people of color um, or people of diverse backgrounds that are actually building the products, that have insights into the strategy, the architecture, the design, the development, all of those nuances are personal issues. Those are issues that we address directly. They're not issues we throw money at. So I think it's important for businesses and brands at this point to recognize that these are things that we can change within ourselves by doing the work within our companies. The other piece is I did give a talk on confronting bias. It was for the network of executive women. And like I mentioned, there were 900 women on the call. And it was wonderful of all different elements in corporate, all the way from individual contributors up to executives that joined in. And what I did is I took them through the background of biases, explaining that there are two types of biases. One is explicit bias, which is the one we're most familiar with. Explicit bias is when you're, you know, a racist. You'll say racist comments or you consciously think that women are are less than men, right? Um, And you believe that to your core so much that you can articulate it. And you do articulate it with passion Uh, You can also be biased, explicit bias contains to the positive, where it's, if I were to say to you, Michael Jordan is the best basketball player in the entire world, and coming from Chicago, that's the reason I know that's the truth, (laughs) that also would be explicit bias, where it's a conscious decision because of where I am that I'm saying that, and I feel that because of personal experiences, right? But the other bias that we don't talk about that often um, is called implicit bias or unconscious bias. And we actually did do a couple of podcast episodes talking about it. But it's important for us to point out that sometimes the things that are happening are not within our conscience. I think it's something like 98% of the decisions that we make are made in our subconscious which means that we create these systems of biases, these racial biases, these gender biases, et cetera, actually because we don't even think about how we feel about certain things. Mm. So implicit bias is the nuances of the fact that we might have people within our organizations, it could be us, that are creating these biases against other people. And within our subconscious, we as humans take our flaws into our work. So in my talk, what I did is I walked them through the differences of bias and implicit bias. And we talked about the fact that humans make about 35,000 decisions a day. Adults. 35,000 decisions today. And I don't even know if they're taking into consideration if you have one or multiple children. Because you know when you have children, then the question isn't just about the decisions you have to make for yourself. Like where do I sit? What do I want to eat? Did I pay my bills on time? Did I get the project done? But you're also asking yourself, did he pee? (laughs) <laughs> Did he eat? Yeah, having a child, that's about another 10,000 thoughts you need to think about. <laughs> uh, and these decisions are part of kind of the way that we come up with the nuances of how these biases are making their way into our work. So we started off with the notion that you've got implicit bias, you've got explicit bias. Implicit bias was the subconscious biases that were happening and that if we take into consideration we're making all these decisions every day, 35,000 plus as adults, what's happening is that our brains are creating shortcuts. Our brains are creating shortcuts because that's the way we operate. And so when we see something or we hear something, whether that be an advertisement or a social media post or something else, fill in the blank, our brain creates a shortcut around it. And the shortcut helps us get through our day by not having to strategically think through all of our decisions. And so with the biases, what we're finding is that these shortcuts have been created around our biases. It's that I've never seen an African-American man before in my town. The only time I saw them were on Cops. So I assume that African-American men are dangerous because of the episode I saw on Cops. That is a biasy shortcut that we create in our heads. Or, like I said, the experience that I had with the police officers where my viewpoint on police was very narrow because of the experiences I had. So it didn't process for me that police could be acting any other way because I had created a shortcut of officer-friendly in my head, right? Uh, And so what we found uh, is that if we're able to talk about this, talk about these shortcuts, expose ourselves and our team to other perspectives, then they're able to recreate those shortcuts. 
they're able to see in a diverse team with a diverse view or a diverse neighborhood or a diverse school of thought that maybe the shortcut they created was inaccurate and over time can resolve that. And that helps us create more inclusive spaces. But I think it's really important uh, to point out there's some other elements in which we recognize this and why it's so important for us, regardless of your industry, to be talking about this and biases in general. There were some questions I got when I was in my session. They were, what are the root causes of these biases and how can I re resolve them? Uh, and what I said is, you know, there's really three main elements in which we can stop and see that our biases, these shortcuts are being created. The first one is the environment we're raised in. Like I mentioned earlier, raised in the suburbs in Illinois, uh, my biases and my shortcuts were created about the police was the example that I gave as well as other things because of what I saw. Um, and how I was raised and, and what was important and valued and talked about in our family. Another big element in which people are seeing these biases created is their social circle. So with most people, if they were to go to their Facebook feed today and looked at their friends list, they'd look a lot like them. Very few people have a diverse spectrum of people that are in their circle. Mm -hmm. And even if we were to talk about diversity, it's not just color. It's, again, that intersectional piece. So do all of your friends, did they go to the same universities? Did they come from the same economic background? Are they from the re same religious background? Do they share the same color as you? All these nuances really influence you. Because you might have someone that has a different you know, color or is from a different race, but their economic status is the same. They grew up in the same neighborhoods you do. So their train of thought is going to be similar. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, we're creating biases that are reinforced by our circles, social circle. The third place that we get it is media, which the people that are listening here are either directly related to that or have hired someone that's supporting them or they have members of their team that are creating content that reinforces these stereotypes. And sometimes the content is not intentional, right? It's that the people that are working have brought their own biases, their own shortcuts to the table, and they're inaccurate. I had a client, um, you know, that I'd worked with before where their marketing director, we talked about the fact that you don't have one, any women, and two, no people of color, no women of color reflective in any of your marketing materials. And yet I was pointing out how women of color were, in fact, the majority of your audience. And the solution was to go find stock photos of random people of color and throw in some women. And that was the way he was going to solve it. Didn't change the content, didn't change the colors, didn't change anything else. Because his thought was, well, if I just show their face, they'll see themselves. And that in itself is the issue, right? It's that it's not just about throwing a person's face up there, but it's about the brand really embracing and understanding and connecting with your audience in ways that show that you get it. Because this is where now we're seeing the brands are going to be in trouble, is that they're not being authentic. So in media, we have the nuances of maybe you have some biases on your team. They don't get it. And because they don't get it, they're pushing out content um, that is not aligned with the needs of your community. The other aspect is the media does push content with intention, right? I mean, it's with intention that, you know, minorities were overrepresented in, in um, police or negative lights, black men in particular. Uh, and so we know and now recognize that this is a bias that's been going on for a really long time. And there's some historical context behind that. Um, but with understanding that this intention is happening, it has influenced the population, both our employees as well as our customers. And so now that we understand, then we can do the work that we need to do uh, to make sure that we're putting out better. We're doing better. And so the next thing that was asked of me in this session was, the, then now what? What, what do I do? And it kind of leads back to what I was saying earlier that, that really you know, bothers me. And that was that brand solution was to throw out a statement and say, you know, we, we unequivocally do not support racism. And as a result, you can count on us, continue to buy, right? And the reality is that is such a very superficial thing to do. Because we would have assumed and hoped that you didn't support racist, right? <laughs> That's, I mean, nobody was like, hey, you know, Target, you know, we don't think you're going to. Of course not, right? So don't assume that your audience, especially the victims of the circumstances, are not smart enough to see through your public statement because they are. 
Instead, what I think brands could do and what we've been supporting and advising our clients to do is to step back and really truly reflect. One, first and foremost, you should always be doing your brand strategy work in relationship to your mission, vision, and organizational products and services. So if you created a brand that doesn't align with your output, then you have created misalignment. So there's some self-awareness that needs to happen to be really honest with yourself as a leader, as well as with the organization to say, are we doing the right work? Did we do the right thing? Because we might not, you know, outwardly support uh, discrimination, but we internally are supporting discrimination by not being open. Mm -hmm. The second thing is understanding the nature of bias. So like we just discussed, it's not about always being conscious of being biased. It's this implicit bias, the unconscious bias that's making its way into the space and impacting your employees as well as the output of your work. And then the third piece is to diversify. We've talked about diversifying your team, also diversifying your network. You as an individual should be surrounding yourself with various perspectives as well as team members that are varied in backgrounds. So that way you can make sure that you've got those perspectives always at the forefront. That helps check your biases. And then the fourth thing is there's obviously the opportunities to do trainings and facilitated workshops. And I've seen a lot of brands kind of post this like, hey, come check out a webinar. Uh, what I would, what I question and I think is really important for us to point out is that I, I advise our brands not to go out and say, let's throw a webinar on unconscious bias for two reasons. One, because you need to know your audience. If your audience is full of diverse elements and people, then when you put out information that only targets one group, then you've lost the opportunity to speak to everyone else, right? It's not like in the case of Black Lives Matter, black people in the community needed to have webinars on allyship, right? That's not what the black people in your audience needed to hear. What they needed to hear was maybe some more supportive ways in which they could be supported or like things that you're doing in the community that you've always been doing in the community to help make sure that you do better and create justice for all. So with that being said, Kai, there were a couple of things we've talked about. So we've got some other resources we'll put out on our website so that you can get it through the show notes uh, so that you can learn more about unconscious bias. You can learn about the root causes of it as well as what does it mean to overcome these biases. Um, And of course, as always, if you need some support, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, We'd be happy to help you. We've got a couple of things we're doing to support uh, new clients. One, we only take on, I think it's no more than six branding clients a year Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we're we're half the way through that Um, but we did open up a couple of new spots for branding clients if they if you found that your organization needed to have a complete review and a redo um, we've got some spots they're very limited you can reach out to us about that we also have opened up some workshops if you just need some assistance kind of navigating through the difficult spaces there's been a lot that's happened lately and you need some guidance on how should you be approaching it what can your business do better We've got some workshops. Um, And then the third element in which we've opened up recently is I'm doing office hours. So if you wanted to do some consulting directly with me, the head strategist, um, we could schedule those in for you. Again, very limited. Um, But for those organizations that are trying to do better and just need some support, we've tried to do our best to open up and make make room um, to support you. So Kai, thank you for joining me today to share your story. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I don't know when we'll have you back on the podcast. I'm always here. (laughs) (laughs) And as always, if you had any questions, you can feel free to reach out to any of us. Thank you so much for joining us today on the Tone Pairs podcast. Thank you. Thank you. My most recent negative experience with law enforcement uh, occurred a couple of years ago when I was actually in my mid-30s. I was coming from a funeral service uh, with my wife, who was also in the vehicle. Mind you, we were both professionally dressed in church clothes, if you will, but definitely uh, dressed in in professional attire. Um, I failed to um, come to a complete stop. I made um, a right-hand turn, which I acknowledge was my mistake. However, for a minor traffic violation, uh, the fact that there were three squad cars called to the scene, two motorcycle officers called to the scene, and two bicycle cops. Uh, Our vehicle was searched. I had to place my hands um, on top of the uh, steering wheel while the vehicle was searched. Uh, Then I was asked to get out of the vehicle. 
Um, all this was taking place with such a police presence that local bystanders at the public transportation station began to record the incident. Once they began to shout, we're recording, brother, we're not going to let them do anything to you, uh, I was allowed to uh, re-enter my vehicle. Uh, I was given the citation and allowed to go about my way. Um, but certainly thankful that bystanders uh, informed, notified the police that the incident was being recorded. Otherwise, I don't know if the situation would have been resolved the same way. I'm Amber Anderson. Thanks again for listening to the Toten Pairs podcast. I'll be back in a couple of weeks to bring you a fresh perspective on women. In the meantime, go ahead and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss an episode. And if you feel inclined to do so, we'd love to hear from you. Leave us a review or send us an email at hi at or catch us on social at Toten Pairs across the internet.